sold at Best Buy for $1,998 as a multimedia package that included speakers and a color desk jet printer. As a company, Packard Bell established its consumer base by offering low cost PCs under a moniker that recycled the names of other well-known companies like Hewlett Packard, Pacific Bell, and Bell Laboratories, which could mislead some first time customers like my parents into believing that their products were better than they really were. And around this time, Packard Bell was selling quote unquote new computers that were actually made in part with previously owned components or used parts. So there's a likelihood that this machine was not entirely new upon purchase. Nonetheless, to mark the occasion, my parents decided to take these photos. That's me on the left wearing the Epcot Disney t-shirt and my brother sitting at the machine preoccupied playing three-point basketball, a simulation of the NBA All-Star Games three-point shooting contest made for MS-DOS. We posed with the computer as if it were a new member of our family and we cared for it by, cloth by clothing its physical body with a translucent plastic covering after each use in order to protect it from dust. For example, notice how the printer on the right is covered in plastic. In doing so, and unbeknownst to us, we attempted to preserve an object that was already on, on a path toward obsolescence the minute we turned it on. For me personally, this computer and the models that came after provided windows into other worlds, momentary vectors out of white heteronormative suburbia. I spent hours online and in front of this machine developing habits around its material interface. I came into being on the internet. These photos express what intrigues me most about media objects today, how they configure social relations, structure knowledge, capture attention, recalibrate experiences of time and represent reality. My current research and teaching explore the many ways that our media environments and built environments are co-constitutive. More precisely, I'm interested in how networked technologies shape selfhoods and settings and how what we understand to be urban life increasingly involves exchanges that occur digitally. Much of this research uh, is done together with McLean Clutter in our practice Extents. Uh, Extents is a collaborative that is interested in architecture, urbanism, media, digital culture, and other instruments of life that can be impacted by design. We think that media and architecture are alike in their ability to frame shared experience. Our work seeks to animate this commonality by focusing on the materiality of media, the physical stuff of media that constantly surrounds us as part of the built environment. We design light fixtures, exhibitions, pavilions, houses, towers, cities, and islands, among other things. And in manipulating the materiality of media, our work attempts to develop novel forms of occupation, ornamentation, and collectivity. As an aside, uh, we have a book, Shape Places of Carroll County, New Hampshire, coming out next spring. Uh, the projects that I will present in today's talk oscillate between two understandings of the internet, as site and as situation. Many architects consciously separate site and program and work on them in isolation, almost as a form of data management. On the internet, however, place and protocol are profoundly intertwined. One visits a site, programmed or encoded with multiple intelligences and possible interactions. And humans are not situated in relation to this infrastructure, rather they are extended across the network in many ways and transformed into vectors that link numerous socio-technical actors. Occupying this network, we pass through cables suspended from ceilings and submerged in oceans and transmission towers dotting landscapes and topping skyscrapers. I refer to this life-giving interplay between cultural, technological, and material forces as the urbanity of the internet, which is rooted in my study of works by scholars like Shannon Mattern, Greta Byram, and Malcolm McCullough, um, to name a few. If we increasingly conduct our personal and public lives online and in digital space, what does it mean to develop architecture in an era of high-speed connectivity? To answer this question, uh, I will now transition into discussing some ways of working on the internet. Uh, the first project I will talk about is called Desktops. Uh, right before lockdown in March, I was invited to participate in the Drawing and Proper exhibition at CU Denver. Participants were simply asked to submit a dutiful drawing and a mischievous drawing. At the time, and unaware of the intimacy that we would soon develop uh, with our digital devices, I was thinking about physical and virtual desktops as sites of fluid exchange between human laborers and non-human actors and how these interfaces help to expand our environmental consciousness. 
In computing, the desktop is a representation of a desk upon which folders, documents, notepads, calendars, and trash bins can be placed. Thus, the space of digital labor orients the user by simulating and extending a familiar material condition. However, as media scholar Ivan Rusak points out, these pictograms hide the complex, complex ways in which files make new connections and links through algorithms. He alludes to the social dimension of files and computational procedures that make this virtual environment unique, an encoded interactivity not found in most desks. It's a space where labor and leisure, productivity and play can mix. Like a physical workspace, a virtual desktop can also solicit emotional responses by providing users with a sense of tidiness and through customizable backgrounds and shortcuts, a chance to add personal touches as well. Um, it can convey both the aspirational and boring parts of our digital lives. Desktops can demonstrate the differences in how we think by showing the idiosyncratic ways in which we organize information. It can also reveal similarities in taste. This tension between the individual and the collective or the local and the global also appears in the use of landscape photographs as default backgrounds. These high resolution images often portray natural settings in an idealized and awe-inspiring state without evidence of human interaction or intervention. However, we routinely perform labor and energy intensive tasks atop these pristine vistas, which I argue exacerbates an already harmful relationship that humans have with the environment. In other words, virtual desktops cultivate simultaneous feelings of wonder and indifference that shape how we see the world. For the exhibition, I sought to co-create images that illuminate and celebrate the scenes, gaps, and fissures between our physical and virtual workspaces, instead of hiding embedded labor uh, behind the cool and seamless veneer that characterizes so much of contemporary digital life. To begin, I hired remotely located crowd workers on Amazon Mechanical Turk, a website where people from all over the world perform discrete on-demand on tasks that computers are currently unable to do, like answer questions or write product descriptions. I paid 100 anonymous workers to describe the physical desk upon which their computer and other belongings rest. I also asked them to upload a screen capture of their virtual desktop. From this list, I selected two entries and without seeing the actual physical desk, designed an image of an environment that supports and embellishes the text. Um, so now I'll discuss the two images. Uh, the first uh, description that was provided um, that I chose uh, reads as follows. On my desk, I keep a lot of space open and try to not make it messy with papers and other things. I keep a bonsai tree, a notepad, one pen stand holding some pens, pencils, and scissors, a Bible, a mobile stand to keep my mobile display clear, and a diary. I keep my desk clean so that I'm comfortable while working. I have a big monitor for my laptop so I can see the contents of my work clearly. I like to keep the desk very attractive and pleasant looking. In response to their mentions of mobility and cleanliness, I envisioned a desk with, a deta with detachable legs and armatures secured with clamps. Bright green foam pads ensure a soft separation between parts. Floating windows frame other views of the desk, and the screen cap of the virtual desktop is applied as a texture map on almost everything in order to reconstitute the perceived edges between technology, furniture, and environment. The second description reads as follows. Small and cramped with lots on it, including my therapy lamp, many mugs, keyboard, trackpad, some medicine, and usually candy bar wrappers. It is as chaotic as I am, and the lack of organization reflects that. This rendering employs similar imaging techniques as the previous slide, using a cropped view of a marijuana plant instead of a costume dog posing in a field. I was especially drawn in how the screen cap hinted at a physical place, the Canadian flag, an MP4 recording of a rock band from Ontario, the weather apps below zero temperature reading, and how the virtual and physical desktops inspired opposite cleaning habits, one explicitly empty and the other implicitly messy. These are snapshots of a system inscribed to the materiality of networked infrastructure, the browsers, screens, alphanumeric IDs, taskbars, wires, and emojis that comprise our expanded environments. They present the internet as deep and shallow, grainy and smooth. By working through the representation of the desktop, I attempt to show how its dutiful and mischievous tendencies prompt new relationships between people and context. 
This next project, Lossy Lossless, was a temporary environment for a nonprofit arts organization called Materials and Applications, or MA, based in Los Angeles. The project uses a public storefront space as a site through which to vivify the changing urban image of the surrounding neighborhood. We thought of our design for the storefront space as a kind of thick, layered tableau in which image and object, inhabitant and passerby, mix and mingle as, as a part of a condensed uh, community reflection. Uh, when MA approached us about this project, they explained that we would be the soft opening of their new space on Sunset Boulevard in Echo Park, and that our installation would be programmed with various community activities throughout its duration. This directed our attention to the urban context. It was interesting to us that this new space on Sunset is located in a rapidly gentrifying neighborhood. This seemed to set up a complex problematic given that MA's mission centers on public engagement through art and architecture. So our project sought to provide a forum for the discussion of the politics and stakes surrounding the neighborhood's changing urban image. To do this, we wanted the storefront to feel like an extension of the street and a space that is meant to be viewed from the outside by the passerby like a diorama as much as it is meant to be occupied. We began a kind of Google Street View analysis moving up and down sunset to gather what we saw as markers of the boulevard's past and future fading remnants like the stacked tires around the flat fix next door and abandoned phone booths, as well as markers of change, like the folding chalkboard placards outside of bougie cafes, ATMs, and bike lane signs. Uh, these are just a few examples of some of the urban elements that we uh, collected. So uh, these elements were digitally modeled and recombined in the wall covering that lines the space. Some elements appear ghostly and translucent, like they are in the act of disappearance, while others are purposely pixelated, which we thought of as a trait of digital loss. This wall covering image was printed on a reflective material so that as one looks through the storefront, the exterior street life is reflected amidst the wall covering elements, blurring the inside and outside and figuring the onlooker into the image of the boulevard. Filling the rest of the space is a mutably occupiable floorscape assembled from an off the shelf data center floor system and covered with, with custom-made high-density foam padding. Meant to vivify the materiality of the digital world, we chose a data center floor composed of clearly defined tectonic elements so that the object quality of the floor elements would prompt comparative relationships with the objects depicted in the surrounding wall covering. Combined with the traffic cones, foam tiles, and furniture pieces distributed throughout the space, we hoped for a reading of objects spilling out from the walls and onto the sidewalk, even while the walls collect objects from the street. The wall covering, the storefront space, the glass, and the reflected exterior street life were all considered material components within a thickened image of Sunset Boulevard on the cusp of change. So now I'll just cycle through a few um, construction photos. So here you can see the storefront and um, limited space uh, that we had to, to stage the construction. So every day we had to bring out all of the materials and then every, at the end of the night, we had to um, kind of bring in, bring in all of the materials from the sidewalk. Um, here you can see the reflective print going up and um, also the raised data, data center floor. Um, on the bottom left of your screen, you could see the uh, some of the custom milled foam tiles that are imprinted with material swatches from AutoCAD. And then we also custom milled foam pieces uh, for sitting. Um, and you'll notice on the, the edges of these pieces, the, the rough tabs along the edge um, are low resolution. We consider them low resolution vestiges of the CNC. Uh, so how to make an object kind of register the, the process of the, um, the, the machine. Uh, and lastly, we also commissioned a local fabricator to make uh, neon fixtures. And so these are just a few of those. And uh, this is one of my favorite images because of the multiple layered reflections. Uh, note the reflection of the street on the glass and the hazy reflection of the street on the wall behind, as well as the shadows that are cutting across the floor. Uh, the space can accommodate different forms of occupation. So these are just a few shots of how you could lay or sit on different elements. Um, and I think this image does a good job of showing how the multi-layered construction helps to express the componentry and transform the parts into objects, 
So for example, um, notice how this, the circles that are cut into the foam accept the pedestal of the data center floor tile and almost frame it or treat it as if it's its own object in the space. And then here are some shots from the opening and the space saturated in green with the overhead lights off. Um, we also anticipated that the project would have an extended life online through social media. Um, the space is in a constant state of flux, each image showing a fleeting assembly of urban life. Thinking about the transformation of material as it passes through information networks, uh, this next project, Online On Site, explores frameworks for digital equity and examines how urban form is increasingly influenced by broadband and wireless accessibility. If equity is about ensuring that everyone has what they need to survive and thrive, this moment in time is showing us how access to the internet is considered even more of a necessity. According to the National Digital Inclusion Alliance, digital equity is defined as, quote, a condition in which all individuals and communities have the information technology capacity needed for full participation in our society, democracy, and economy, end quote. Many users search the web for learning and employment opportunities or for places to belong. It's precisely this access to other ways of being that's of interest to me. Uh, this seven month research project, which started in 2018 with support of the, uh, from the Michigan Mellon Project on the Egalitarian Metropolis was prompted by two developments, the Federal Communications Commission's repeal of net neutrality and the Census Bureau's decision to move their data collection online for the 2020 survey. In both cases to be counted or to exist requires access to digital technology which is a problem for those unable to afford internet, computers, or mobile devices. Detroit, the site for this research, is one of many places in the United States where this digital inequity persists. Indeed, despite recent investment, uh, Detroit has one of the lowest rates of internet connectivity in the United States. Um, many of those affected are school-aged kids that need the internet to complete their homework, submit job applications, or simply socialize with their classmates. Uh, to give you an idea, about 3 million kids across the country don't have adequate access. As an educator trying to teach during a public health crisis, I've seen firsthand how uneven internet service provision and access to technology have, has disrupted learning experiences. A few of the scenarios I will show in this presentation, like mobile signal enhancing units or parking lot hotspots, have since become temporary fixes to a larger systemic problem of inequity. Uh, these digital, or sorry, these, um, these design studies, which were created well before the world shifted to remote learning and distance living, occupy the space between pure solutionism and blind fantasy in order to suggest a new cultural imaginary for the digital infrastructure that's shaping our cities. To understand um, Detroit's digital ecosystem, I started by mapping the city. As evinced by the blog Detroitography, mapping Detroit is an all too familiar spatial practice. So I wanted to approach this process critically. Also, the maps used by the FCC to allocate funding for telecom uh, services continually bungle data and misrepresent need, leaving black and brown residents in marginalized neighborhoods with few options for broadband. In a sense, their inaccurate maps justify inequity, excusing the lack of investment in places that would clearly benefit from it. This is yet another reason for a more critical eye on the cartography. Using publicly available spatial data, I created maps that show amenities, demographic information, and broadband service provision, among other data points. Uh, without going into too much detail, uh, the maps attempt to, attempt to represent the emptiness of deindustrialized sites as data-rich terrains that are, situ that are saturated with complex systems, ecologies, and opportunities. In parallel, I interviewed high school students in Detroit um, that were enrolled in ARC prep a University of Michigan college preparatory program that aims to create a pathway to a future career in architecture and design. These students shared with me how the internet influences their identities, daily routines, and expectations of the city. Uh, the animation shown here represents our conversations as messaging threads framed by various apps and websites that were mentioned by the participants. Um, I also spoke with members of other organizations throughout the city to gain additional insights. Uh, this combination of maps and interviews, along with information from news articles and toolkits, established the foundation for imaging possible features. 
Contrary to discussions happening around quote unquote smart cities, I became interested in grassroots efforts to build an alternative internet because I like imagining that there could be another way to conceive urban life. One that doesn't involve optimization, increased surveillance or data mining. And that doesn't assume that those things are inherently good. I also think it's important to recognize that our cities have always been smart, that they're inscribed with many systems of knowledge that exist outside of the dominant white patriarchal framework. I became familiar with community-driven mesh networks from all over the world, including NYC Mesh, Berlin Freifunk, and Detroit's own Equitable Internet Initiative. Many of these, of these mesh programs explain how to set up your own network through downloadable how-to guides and toolkits like the one shown here. Distinct from traditional hub and spoke networks, uh, mesh networks interconnect distributed fields of routers, leveraging the bandwidths of multiple points of internet connectivity to create broad territories of wireless access. In other words, meshes replace a single access point with many access points. These municipally subsidized networks would decrease dependency on top-down internet service provision and allow community members to have more control over their data. Since mesh networks are decentralized and non-hierarchical, the only way to shut down or disrupt a mesh is to turn off every node in the network, making them more resilient to interference. The more nodes you install, the bigger and faster the network becomes. And I'm especially interested in how the dispersal of routers, often attached to residential balconies or rooftops of trusted neighbors, reveals a latent social network. After reviewing all the data and learning about meshes, I chose three sites to explore uh, different design strategies at the scale of a building, a block, and a neighborhood. Uh, and, and in this transition from data collection to design proposition, the goal wasn't to provide a solution to the city's connectivity problem. Rather, it was to understand what role architecture might play in the problem and, and to show how different stakeholders could come together around shared concerns. So now I'm going to talk about the design studies in just a, a bit more detail. Um, each site is anchored by a public library indicated here with a pink plus and a half mile radius uh, from the public library was used to determine the perimeter or edge of each site speculation, uh, which is a common urban design metric. Uh, the first site is located in Southwest Detroit. Here's a Google Earth aerial view um, and it features re religious institutions, locally owned businesses um, uh, and, and locally owned businesses that together uh, can form a possible mesh network. And in my interviews with uh, the high school students, uh, many of them told me that they, uh, they go to the McDonald's um, or they go to a, a McDonald's for 24 hour Wi-Fi access when they don't have internet at home. Um, and they're actually advised by their teachers to do so. And in places like Coachella Valley, California, buses were being converted into mobile hotspots at night um, as a temporary solution. Um, so this first design study considers McDonald's as a possible community anchor. Um, this diagram shows line of sight. Um, a technique that's used to identify clear pathways for wireless signal transmission. And this is a technique that um, a lot of uh, uh, community mesh network organizations use to, to determine points within the network. Uh, this existing McDonald's is reimagined as an educational space that provides computers, tutoring services, and workstations to students. An abandoned home in the upper left of your screen is replaced with communal townhouses oriented toward the restaurant. In between the restaurant and the townhouses are shared outdoor spaces with public solar charging stations. A community garden is introduced to an adjacent lot, so the surrounding neighborhood and the McDonald's have access to fresh produce. And these are just a few um, zoomed in shots for, uh, of the proposal. So here is a closer look at the educational spaces clipped onto the front of the existing building. Um, shared outdoor spaces in front of the townhouses. And here um, we rezoned the parking lot around Wi-Fi antennas. So rather than having individual spaces, you have zones that, um, that are oriented towards uh, this infrastructure. And then in um, my interviews with various uh, community members, I um, learned about how Detroit's main public library um, was also being used, its parking lot was being used as an alternative drive-in to stream Netflix. So people were parking there to actually feed off of the Wi-Fi to watch um, and stream content. Uh, but post-pandemic, this has a, a very different resonance as many people are, use, are accessing uh, public Wi-Fi from their parked vehicles. And then here's a view um, inside of the addition showing uh, the study areas facing a new school bus drop-off. The second site is located in Northeast Detroit. 
and it is bisected by a major highway and next to a defunct golf course. Uh, and here's an aerial view that shows um, that, that shows the highway, and you can see how the highway cuts um, through the urban fabric. And then this diagram again shows line of sight from the public library uh, and how the abundance of trees would obstruct wireless signal transmission. The neighborhood has a significant amount of vacant land and housing, and this is what it would look like um, without the unoccupied properties. Uh, and this study considers the possibility to re-describe this vacancy through digital uh, logics. Design proposition features a large scale network defined by social and cultural programs. Unoccupied houses and industrial buildings are converted into religious institutions. Banks, businesses, and rec centers are pulled away from corridors and redistributed into the residential blocks as clusters, as seen here. And um, in my conversations with the city of Detroit, they highlighted churches as spaces for um, community organizing and how their high rooftops would actually be uh, really good for, for signal transmission. It was something that they were thinking about as, a, um, as an institution. Um, and so here we're thinking about um, how to use, how to imagine churches as possible nodes or anchors within a network, but also how trees could um, not just provide shade, but also network support. Um, new housing types are developed with shared space and internet access in mind, and the defunct golf course is transformed into an urban forest. This is just another view of the clusters and the radiating residences, and then um, a view uh, in perspective um, of one of the new housing types, a ring of duplexes with shared porches uh, that feed off of Wi-Fi from a central antenna. Uh, the third and final site is located in Northwest Detroit along Grand River Avenue, a commercial thoroughfare lined with hair salons, markets, convenience stores, and automotive shops. Between three major anchor sites, uh, uh, an, ex an existing community center, um, library, and McDonald's, two blocks were developed as a community land trust where property lines could be dissolved in favor of shared Wi-Fi and resources. Uh, vacant building buildings shown in dark blue are envisioned as community equipped daycares, greenhouses and barbershops owned and managed by residents living in, in the area. Again, instead of the corridor, uh, these businesses populate the residential blocks. The wing of an existing church in the upper left of your screen is transformed into a tech hub where both seniors and youth can get online. An adjacent community center will supply internet access to the blocks in addition to a nearby closed school sitting on dark fiber that can be reactivated. Uh, and here you can see some of the modifications to the houses um, and sidewalks and pavement. Uh, we were exploring the idea of shared, um, shared side yards and driveways. And then just left of middle, um, you can see two houses and a back shed um, and how they're combined to, to create a, um, a daycare. And on the right is a, a community garden. And then if we turn off the trees in this drawing just for a second, um, cords and cables are consolidated into uh, what, what we refer to as fiber optic berms that cut through the site, creating civic spaces for residents to gather in various ways. For this, we were inspired by um, roadside fiber installation, as well as drawings from Wolfgang Schimmelbusser's um, Disenchanted Night series. And this, uh, this drawing here on the left um, is actually showing San Jose's electric light tower. Um, again, we were, th we were thinking about um, forms of public assembly around public utilities. And finally, this is um, a view of one of those fiber optic berms next to the community garden. Um, we're in the process right, um, right now of developing some of the ideas from this first phase of design research, uh, but now at the building scale um, with support from U of M and in partnership with both the city of Detroit Department of Innovation and Technology and community stakeholders in the neighborhood north, um, northwest of downtown. Um, our team is in the very early stages of community engagement. Um, which we've had to do over Zoom these last few months. We've transcribed these conversations and started to work through some initial design ideas using quotes from the interviews to begin. Um, we're entering the next phase, which involves more collaborative design um, with various stakeholders. Uh, the pandemic and, and the strain it has put on our digital infrastructure has made our team's conversations with community members harder to have and even more relevant to address. On a practical level, we run into challenges um, when speaking with community members um, due to uneven internet access, the very issue this project is addressing. Um, and only two years into the project, uh, we're on a steep learning curve. Uh, to understand the city, we did things that architects have always done. We mapped, we interviewed, we speculated, 
Um, and as we enter this next phase of research, especially with, unresolved, with an unresolved public health crisis and a tech industry that's constantly evolving, uh, we expect that we will have to try again and again um, to work toward a more just, equitable, and connected future. And this brings me to the last project that I'm going to present called Digital Commons for a competition that sought proposals for an iconic landmark in Silicon Valley. Uh, building off of some ideas and online on site, we started the project by asking ourselves three questions. Uh, what does it mean to build an icon for the 21st century public? How do we engage or disengage from public life in a context of ubiquitous computing, global pandemic, social distancing, and ever-present telematic connectivity? And if public life in the 21st century extends to the digital sphere, how can urban design support equity and access to digital technology? Digital Commons is a catalytic proposal for Arena Green Park in San Jose, California that responds to public life in a digital world. The site is near the airport in San Jose and adjacent to Google's future campus. Designed to present an iconic image from above for the, for the airplane passerby or the Google Earth flaneur, the proposal consists of three parts. A distributed digital forest, reflectories, and uh, an observatory. To the east and west are two zones that complexly intertwine nature, culture, and technology, exploring connection and disconnection within urbanity and digital life. Spread across these zones is a distributed digital forest in which trees work together with new pavilions to provide free public Wi-Fi uh, through, through a wireless mesh network. Though San Jose is the capital of Silicon Valley, it is one of the worst connected cities in uh, California, ranking 80th in the state. Um, here, visitors navigate a lushly forested landscape enhanced by pervasive digital connectivity. By combining vegetation and technology, the digital forest attracts visitors from many age groups and constituencies. For instance, this image depicts a how to use your smartphone training session with seniors. Pavilions throughout the site, like this one, sponsor a range of activities while providing stations to plug in, sit down, and charge up. Um, energy harvested on the site is stored in large batteries um, see, as seen here, and used for lighting as well as uh, for powering uh, visitors' devices. Um, nested within the digital forest are enclosures called reflectories. These spaces afford the rare opportunity to disconnect. Each reflectory is clad in a mesh enclosure through which cellular signals cannot penetrate. For this, we were inspired by uh, Faraday cages and how they prevent the transmission of electromagnetic waves. The mesh also creates dappled light inside and sand floors inhibit speed and dampen urban noise. Designed in varying sizes and configurations, individual, individual reflectories afford space for deliberately offline activities ranging from meditation to conversation to group discussions. They offer a chance to be alone or with others in the city and off the grid. Uh, and here is a view just outside of one of the reflectories looking toward a circular ramp that's leading up to the third part of the proposal, an area called the observatory. Comprising an expansive uh, elevated platform that bridges the Guadalupe River and an immense elevator tower, uh, the observatory explores the various ways that we see and are seen in today's digitally expanded public sphere. The elevator stops at grade to load passengers before traveling 200 feet into the air to provide dramatic views of the surrounding urban context and finally lands at platform level. The platform is designed in accordance with the pixel logic of the digital pic, with colors and tones sampled from Google Earth. From some altitudes, it appears to blend into the, into the surroundings as a seamless aerial image. While from others, the cellular logic of the platform surface becomes clear, appearing as a low resolution glitch in a high res context. From the platform, occupants are, are afforded views of the riparian zone below, while one's motion along an energy harvesting uh, kinetic floor activates dynamic lighting visible from the surroundings, the air, and even digital satellite. Um, and I'll end today's uh, Zoom session um, with a short video zooming into the project. Actually, let me make sure that the sound is on. There we go.
Okay, uh, thank you for your attention. And uh, this is a re reminder that if you haven't already, but can, please vote. Thanks. Uh, well, thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you so much for this lecture. I, I just wanted to, first of all, say that I really appreciate kind of the editorial process you've gone through. We all suffer from uh, attention problems these days and having the opportunity to really look at four projects for a prolonged amount of time and uh, dive in, I think has been really great. Um, uh, let's see, it's really fantastic to see the two bodies of work together. And I imagine many of the students watching tonight uh, you know, the, with the first projects that take on the idea of the internet, sort of challenging our conceptions of it um, without, with kind of in the realm of installation and like really beautiful uh, kind of representations, physical and digital. Um, let's see, where am I going with this? Uh, our, the, the point I'm trying to say is like a kind of deeply intellectual problem complemented by the really applicable problem, by like real kind of proposals, architectural kind of design uh, with a site and a sort of uh, community in mind. And I think these two notions of community are really very important. Um, I guess I should also say students and attendees, please use the chat, uh, share comments and questions, and we'll get to all of these. Um, I was curious to tease out a little bit across the projects, uh, the idea of time and the internet, because it, it, it seems to me so integral to the work you're describing, both in terms of the internet sort of diminishing any kind of uh, conception we have of how time works and uh, takes uh, sort of expands, uh, even just, you know, us being on this Zoom tonight or being able to meet in a heartbeat. Um, but also in the sense of its difference with specifically the discipline of architecture or the practice of architecture. So, you know, we're always negotiating sort of the societal change that happens at a very different kind of speed than uh, the speed in which we can make buildings. And you're adding this third component of infrastructure that happens at an entirely different speed and becomes obsolete so fast. So how would kind of an urbanism that accounts for these types of infrastructure that keep changing every year kind of mm. be sustainable? Uh, yeah, I mean, that's a really, that's a really great question. Um, yeah, I mean, time is definitely something that uh, we think about in our work a lot, that I think about a lot. Um, and in many ways, I think that um, there are a couple that come to mind uh, um, right away. So I think that what's interesting about media objects is that um, they're uh, they're produced th uh, they're produced from raw materials that are mined from the earth, which is to say that the the objects themselves are um, kind of embedded in like deep histories um, and like geological histories um, of the earth, um, and yet the um, the operations of these devices actually um, make it so that we can live life in a much faster and more convenient way. So there's there's a kind of layering of um, um, understandings of time that happens mm -hmm. in how the how the device is designed and how it's engaged. Um, I think your question has to do with um, with uh, like the sustainability of of these kinds of um, this kind of infrastructure being used. Um, right, that's the question that you're asking. Yeah, um, I guess has to do with the kind of sustainability of it. Yeah, not not the sustainability per se, but the you know architecture is always confronted with planning for obsolescence, for planning right. for change, and uh, in addition to kind of its material nature, you're adding this kind of um, additional element to reconcile the one of ever changing technology shaping it at multiple scales, and I think it's really fascinating, and uh, I would. Kind of love to tease out how time may find its way into your projects in that way yeah yeah i think that um 
I guess the way that I think about it is that our cities are always sort of, they're always subsuming previous medias, they're always subsuming previous technologies. And that um, I think sometimes with the appearance of a new technology, um, it seems so divorced from the time, the time in which we live. Um, like it seems to operate at a different scale, like, the, like technology affords a certain speed a new technologies afford a certain speed um, of interaction that is different from um, older technologies, but actually the city is constantly recycling and um, absorbing like old technologies within um, its built form. And so um, I think that this has always happened, I think, um, throughout history. Um, and I would say that even um, in ancient times, you know, like the, that when we look at um, media, um, clay tablets, for instance, in which, you know, um, uh, like ideologies were inscribed, like that the, that the media in which we, um, we uh, um, kind of developed like models of governance was also the same media that we used to build our buildings. And that's always sort of happened throughout the years, like whether it's through radio technology and skyscrapers um, or, or now, like through digital technologies and, um, and the buildings that we have today. And, um, so I guess like, I don't know, I guess, I don't know if that answers your question, but mm -hmm. that there's, there's always been this kind of back and forth between built form and the media of the time. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I think what's, what's complicated now is that the internet um, op almost operates at a speed that's much, that's, that's exponentially faster um, in, in such a way that the other media of previous eras, I think, was maybe more, was operating more comparable to like, the, the development of a place. And so it seems like now you get, you get moments of um, intense slowness, but you also get moments of like um, intense speed. And um, yeah, I guess, I don't know. I, I, think it's, I think that's what's so sort of fascinating to me um, about thinking about the internet today is that um, it, compared to kind of um, earlier, earlier forms of media, it seems like a lot um, more complex. <laughs> No, that absolutely does answer my question and it, it leaves me with like a lot more kind of to think about than before this lecture. Uh, I, I also was hoping to uh, speak a little bit to the way you um, take on representation uh, as, a, as an individual and as an office and kind of the very distinct identity that uh, each project advocates for uh, the, the fact that it's always reinvented within your office it's always um, kind of monochromatic and exuberant and vibrant but uh, it's it's never kind of a, a fallback you know it's like the atmosphere is recurrent but the, the each drawing becomes its own kind of little story and I, I find that really fascinating in the work and especially with the projects I hadn't seen before the sort of online on sites and the digital commons project I see a, a new vocabulary that perhaps aspires to be more community friendly or speak to a different mm -hmm. audience and I would love to talk a little bit about that yeah yeah I think that's a great question I, I think that um we I mean I think you mentioned this in the introduction that we have used this phrase um, like consistently or resiliently out of category. Um, like I think that we're always um, thinking about uh, like what it means to fit in and what it means to sort of occupy the edge of, of um, a clearly defined zone and or the limits of a clearly defined zone. And so I think we, we one way of um, thinking about that is through the representation. And so we, we're always thinking about how to represent um, a, a project with a with a lowercase p, you know, like how do we represent um, a project that we take on um, uh, and take into account the terms of just that project, and so the representation, whatever how whatever we decide to do, however we decide to approach it, is always within the kind of context of that particular um, project or the terms and conditions of that particular project, um, and and so it allows us to to like work on. Um, uh, a set of like visual techniques that are really that are bracketed, um, but also at the same time, I think across all the projects, there's a, a similar kind of like vibrancy and um, saturation and um, and like attention to um, different like digital experiences um, that I think we try to capture in all of the work. And I think with the um, digital commons project in particular, you know, I think that was a 
that was a competition that um, th where we were really thinking about the audience and who would be looking at this work because it was an anonymous competition. And so we didn't want to um, put something out there that was uh, so, that in, in, that in its representation was so removed from um, a plausible like urban urban setting. And so we, what we tried to do was actually um, uh, use the um, conventions of Google Street View so the blurred like faces, the the kind of um, compass in the upper right corner, the um, the kind of arrows that orient you toward um, uh, uh, different views. Like we we tried to sort of mine um, the interface of Google Earth and actually use that as a and, and treat that as a familiar interface um, with which people kind of interact with the world. And so I think in the representation, it's always trying to to pull from like bits and pieces that we that we might be familiar with as um, as members of society that are plugged into um, the internet, um, but also tries to like kind of turn up the volume or like um, sort of move the toggle to the moat to like more saturated and more intense kind of visual effects. Um, yeah, so th I guess those are just a few thoughts that come to mind. Yeah, I have um, uh, a student, uh, I, I will transition to questions from the audience in a little bit, but I think this one feels uh -huh. pertinent, so I don't want us to talk in circles. Uh, I had a student DM uh, to ask about um, your use of color and the specificity mm -hmm. with which its project is kind of represented by, uh, by specific color selection. Yeah, that's a great question and, um, and a complicated one. I think that we, um, uh, especially with the installations, a lot of the installation work, we, um, our approach to color is, well, I guess it all started really with um, the kind of monochromatic environments really started with Alasi Lossless, um, the, the second project that I showed tonight. Um, and in that project, we, um, we wanted to pick a color that felt in, intrinsically digital, like a color that felt like it was of um, the virtual world. And so this like seafoam green um, is, is a color that I think many people have associated with um, digital space. Um, it was also a color when we were looking at materials that we could possibly use for that project, um, we, we sort of landed on um, a particular kind of foam that's used in um, for nautical purposes and, um, and like found landed on that color. And we sort of said like, okay, this is gonna be what we're gonna commit to. And then in subsequent projects, I think our approach to color has just been to think about um, how to produce a total environment, like how to produce a space that you feel immersed in or absorbed into. Um, and that feels um, like it absorbs other objects like into it. And so I think our approach to this was to, yeah, was to pick um, like colors that are vibrant and that don't feel like they're of that you're that they're that you see them frequently around you, um, that but they feel like they're artificial or they feel like they're kind of taken from an artificial place. Yeah, yeah. that's that's a great kind of thing to end on. I, I was I, I did have in mind that it refers to kind of mining a vocabulary from the internet from being as unnatural as it gets that it's familiar, but also from uh, maybe otherworldly and. Um, Tell me a little bit about, you mentioned uh, the piece or the installations as total works of art. And mm. that refers to a very specific architecture that I would love if you could expand on and speak to the students <laughs> a little bit about. I think of course not in a kind of historical lesson uh, side, but yeah. kind of as a, as yeah, a reference that might be slightly obscure for some of the audience. That's a good question. I guess, I guess it was less, um, I guess I was thinking about it less as a total work of art and more, um, I guess I was thinking about um, the use of the word total more in terms of like fully, fully immersive and like, mm -hmm. um, and um, consuming. Um, and um, I guess, yeah, I don't know, I guess, um, I guess that's just our interpretation of the work. I, could you say more about, um, no, I guess you said like your reading. Like, your reading of, yeah, your reading of like the total work of art. Yeah, um, I think you said to total art, art work. Yeah. yeah, you said total environment, and I of course projected, yeah. and I was, I, I heard total work of art because that's <laughs> like, it. Just seems to me like the kind of Gesamtkunst work uh, exemplified, but like coming out of the internet. 
uh, where- Yeah, yeah, it's like, right. It's like considering like the, the everything, like the objects, the screens, the media, all of the various medias that surround us as part of the environment. <laughs> and that um, typically when we think about environment today, um, we might, you know, I think one might only be thinking about um, like kind of natural environments um, that are sort of untouched or without human intervention. But I think that um, in our work, we try to think about, we try to sort of expand the definition of environment or think about them as expanded environments that, that also um, consume or absorb like other technologies, other, other, other objects that we use to media to, to negotiate or navigate our everyday lives um, and that those are also part of the like the built environment that we occupy so i think it's similar and, and it, to some degree it's maybe similar to like the gatum, i can never say this word but the total work um and and um um to a degree i think that like the, the consideration or the attention to sort of more than just the the kind of limits of the space is definitely part of what we think about and it's inherent to the internet too, right? Like the, the idea, and this is like a very kind of basic argument, but like the idea that the digital is all a dyadic system where things are not pronounced differently or emphasized more, it's all ones and zeros, and then everything gets an equal amount of attention. That felt really important in your first project, yeah. the desktop project as well. Um, uh, very last question uh, with regards to the online on sites project that uh, I, I'm super interested in and can't believe I haven't come across already uh, before. Um, I wanted to ask a little bit about perhaps in relation to your studio at uh, Syracuse as well, kind of the intersection of design and activism and sort of community mm -hmm. engagement uh, especially as it spans a spectrum within the project from kind of offering an infrastructure of sort of um, a methodology all the way to, to maybe also a total work of art. <laughs> uh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I, I think that, I mean, so the studio that I'm teaching at Syracuse um, started by looking at <clears throat> like the infrastructure of mutual aid networks. Um, and um, I think especially this summer, I mean, mutual aid has existed well before this moment, but, um, but in um, designing the studio for the, for the, the kind of VC cohort, um, I was really, at the time, I was really kind of fascinated by the way in which the internet was enabling all of these different like social interactions uh, between people that existed, that um, live in many different places. Um, and that, you know, in a time of physical distancing, the internet became the kind of fabric or the, the like mesh that, that like connected various actors and like allowed people to, um, to act quickly, um, whether it's about the distribution of resources or, um, or um, through the distribution of information. And, um, and so I think at Syracuse, like um, the studio is like trying to explore our capacity as architects to move between physical and virtual space and to think about um, these kinds of infrastructures as um, means uh, means toward um, uh, kind of more care and and, uh, and and means toward the creation of more just environments. Um, and I think that the um, the work, the, especially the online onsite project, um, now that it's transitioning into even more of a, a project that's rooted in a place where we're meeting with various community stakeholders and we're actually trying to like make the project parts of the project real. Um, um, as, a, as a building project. Um, I think that it's been interesting, like trying to, to use the internet, um, to use things like Zoom um, to, tr to, to hold meetings with members and to try to invent like other ways to engage, um, especially for people who aren't so familiar with like these kinds of environments, like who use the internet in very different ways. Um, that aren't using things like concept board or Miro or, or you know, like using digital modeling softwares, and to try and like take, um, to try and take processes like um, co-designing sessions or public forums, and to try to bring those into digital space has been a real challenge, um, but also a really kind of interesting problem to think about. Like, what are the ways in which the internet? Um, how could we learn from the internet to develop like new ways to act 
and like new ways for architects to act in collaboration with um, other audiences, other stakeholders, um, other members of, of a place um, or, or kind of citizens or residents of a place. So I don't know, does that answer your question? I think it's 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 interesting to kind of think about like the the architecture of the internet and what's similar to what we, how we think about the architecture of the sort of built world, the physical world and what's also different. Like what does the internet afford us and how can we learn from it, how it works, how it socializes people in different ways and how we, how can we begin to apply that to the ways in which we as designers also work. Yeah, and it's also interesting to see how the project intersected with a pandemic and you did, uh, I think, a really kind of, uh, yeah. you were very precise in situating that in your presentation to make yeah, to understand really the change in demand and the change in kind of accessibility. Yeah, I mean, that, pro that project, it started, you know, the pre-pandemic and, and um, was really it really started because there there is there was there is still um, very much a problem with connectivity in Detroit, um, and I was just really interested in like what are all of the um, kind of material reasons that that contribute to the lack of internet connectivity, but also I started to get into more of the policies and the um, the kind of govern government structures that also inform um, uh, the decision making and. Um, yeah, and then the pandemic happened, and then it just like laid bare all of the um, inequities, all of the lacks, the lack of resources, um, all of the um, the kind of um, intense um, like necessities for this infrastructure. Like it laid all of that bare, and um, has been really kind of interesting and complicated to be working on in this in this moment. But it's been, it's been exciting. Um, Evelyn has a good question about online on site. Evelyn, would you like to unmute and ask your question? I'll take that as a no and ask the question. Uh, she says, see, one more minute. Okay, I'll do it. Uh, Evelyn, jump in if you want to. Uh, it's really interesting uh, that your projects, which are, which really explore the internet connectivity and urbanism also emphasize green spaces. Why are features like community gardens and urban forests so important to your design, specifically the online on-site project? Such a great question. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah, I think that that comes from, I mean, in the online on-site project, that comes from a lot of the conversations and interviews. Um, so that all of those design proposals or, or propositions were um, created from things that were mentioned in, in conversation or in dialogue with other um, um, community members. And so community gardens, um, urban farms, those, and, and like urban forests, like those are things that, that came up that in the project sort of the volume was sort of turned up or the toggle was sort of switched to the, the most extreme to kind of test or see like what, um, you know, like what would happen if you um, uh, kind of included or, or um, uh, dropped in the most, um, yeah, the most intense or, or developed version of that thing. Um, I also think it's important because those are, those are, I would consider those as like versions of technology, you know, like I think that um, in the talk, I, I think about, um, I, I, I talk about digital technology, or, or maybe use the term technology, and it's by default sort of considered as um, inherently digital, but actually, as I mentioned earlier, I think that the city has always been smart, you know, that, that um, there are other forms of media that have existed pre-digital, uh, before the digital. Um, that um, that are examples of kind of different systems of knowledge, and I think the community garden, the um, in particular, is one where um, a need was um, was met with a means by which to to distribute kind of resources to people, or, or to to also um, redistribute power and control um, to a neighborhood. And so I think that I, I consider those as important, and um, in the same way as or as the same, sorry, as important and also um, um, the same as um, like forms of digital infrastructure too, that those things are, you know, that they, that they're, that both of them coexist to kind of support the needs of a, a, um, a community. I, I enjoyed that moment in the presentation of the religion, the city is already smart. And I don't know if architecture is smart. <laughs> it's like the <laughs> one kind of agent in this equation that needs to be smart. Smartened up, maybe our own discipline. 
Um, but Sundra, would you like parts to... of it are smart. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know. But, uh, yes, there's a lot of intelligence in our discipline. Uh, but Sundra, would you like to ask you a question? I think it fits in with uh, what we're just talking about. Um, sure. Hi, Cyrus and Evie. Um, I found Hi. the lecture very interesting, and I was um, kind of curious about um, when you you know you were talking about how cities um, they're kind of focused on um, the sort of optimization and this efficiency rather than really a critique of what is happening with the information that we have. And um, I was wondering if you could speak um, more to architecture's role in maybe critiquing the information gathering process and um, that rather than just, I guess, making um, uh, like the internet more accessible to everyone. Cause like that's, we have like the access, but what about what it's, what they're doing with um, us, like our data in the internet or digital space, I yeah. guess. Yeah, I think that's a great question. I, I, I mean, I think this is, I think your question is precisely why I was really interested in community mesh networks. Um, because those are forms of internet infrastructure uh, or models of internet infrastructure that um, are, are bottom up. They're, they res they're meant to resist top down or, or, or they're designed to resist top down um, governance and control. Um, and that those, infrastru those um, uh, infrastructures, I think, allow for more um, kind of management of um, a, like one's own data. And so, Oftentimes with, with mesh networks, you see um, like the, um, the design of a, an intranet, like with an A, um, as, a, as like a kind of closed network that's managed and operated and controlled by like just those that use it. Um, and so, um, yeah, I think that that's like a big reason why I'm really interested in that. And also that there's a, there's a, a kind of pre-existing like network of trust that exists like before the, that infrastructure is implemented that like, Oftentimes they exist because um, a group of people who know each other or, or who um, see benefit in kind of like collaborating or sharing resources come together and they decide to like build this infrastructure. Um, and I think that um, that network, like because you have control of that um, infrastructure, um, uh, it, it allows you to use the internet, I think in um, a very different way. Um, I think that um, because uh, this infrastructure was um, designed by, um, uh, well, I would say that the internet is, um, there's, a, there's a, a kind of whiteness to the internet that I think um, makes it such that um, we um, feel like we have to use it in a certain way. And so like, that's why there's always a move towards optimization, like more surveillance, more data mining, more data sharing. Um, I think that what's fascinating about these networks is that they try to, to like, occupy a different space. You know, they occupy a space where it's not about like being fast, but it's about actually being slow. And it's about um, exchanging information in a more local, in a, in a more local, locally scaled way. Um, and not um, about, um, not inherently about a kind of larger, the, lo the larger infrastructure. Um, thanks, Sarah. That's, that was, and Lysandra, great question. Uh, Ewan, do you want to jump in? I'm trying to, there's no judgment passed in the questions. I'm trying to weave them together. That's the non-particular order. Hi, uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, my question um, is, um, how would you um, describe or talk about um, if it's possible, the possible future of having internet traffic as the central focus, um, instead of having the hard infrastructure like um, car road, uh, those kind of thing, or a sewer system as the um, focus, for example, how we build, usually build neighborhood a house around uh, where the hard resources are easy to find and, or to connect. Um, so that's, that's the first question. And then following with that, what's the notion of having um, the connected and disconnected area that like you discussed um, and uh, in consideration with uh, internet uh, insecurity or like net, uh, digital network, uh, um, how, how do you say equity, uh, inequity or something like having the access to the internet, uh, how would this affect also with the uh, design? 
Yeah, I think that's a really good question. Um, so the first question um, you were asking about how to just how to um, the, you asked about the possibility to make internet infrastructure the kind of central focus of an urban an urban design project, right? Like as opposed to other forms of infrastructure, right? Is that, is right. That correct? Because usually yeah. it's like where you have the all the buildings, and then you plan where to uh, establish the uh, internet. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, I think that, that um, that's a really good question. I think that the online on-site project, um, ha, like I think the online on-site project tries to do a little bit of that. Like it, it um, maybe doesn't make it the central focus, but I think it it um, sort of highlights it or, um, or um, at least like gives it a lot more focus than it typically gets. Um, and I think that uh, with, infrastructure though you always have to think about it as um, part of a larger system with other other necessary infrastructures um, and so yeah I don't know I'd be curious I, I don't know if I have an answer to that question I, I think it's a good one I, um, it makes me think that um, it makes you think about actually Evie's first question that has to do with sustainability like things always change technology always changing and like what you know even with like the the appearance of, of things like 5G, um, which is, you know, I think would would um, uh, initiate a very different kind of city, um, one that's not based on, um, and that's actually based on like closer proximity, for instance. Um, but then once 5G is over and like you know a new technology emerges, like I think it it would produce a very different kind of city. Um, and so I don't know about centering it on internet infrastructure, but um, because I think. As Evie's question pointed out, like technology is always changing, um, but yeah, maybe maybe there is a way. I don't know. Maybe there's a way to to think about that. Um, and I guess your second question had to do with internet security, right? That was that was what you said. Yeah. So uh, uh -huh. thinking about how um, the ac the access of in internet, and then when you have some area that's connected and. Uh, intentionally disconnected area that sounds like even uh, more scary to me than uh, a land without people. <laughs> so how would this kind of situation um, affect architecture? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, yeah, I guess, I guess, um, hmm. yeah, I guess that with that, I guess you're maybe talking a little bit about the Digital Commons project. The, with the intentional, like with the reflectories that are intentionally about being off the grid. Um, and I guess that project was really trying to almost hold up a mirror to the way in which we interact with technology today, um, that we're so kind of enmeshed and plugged into the grid that the idea of being off the grid seems like impossible and also almost undesirable. And so I think that that project was really trying to put that on the table. Like, like what would it look like to actually be in the middle of everything, but be offline? And like, what, is that, what does that mean? How does that maybe um, kind of redirect our attention toward each, each other in, in different ways? How does that, um, uh, um, you know, create a different kind of appreciation for the urban environment? Um, and so, yeah, and I think what's also interesting about security um, is that at the moment, I think a lot of our data moves through um, many different places. It actually, you know, I think that there's a likelihood, for instance, that your data right now is moving through um, other countries before it actually moves through, um, you know, the town next next to you. Um, and that, um, you know, in a way, like you can imagine that our security is already being compromised. And I think you, you're asking a really good question. It's like, what does that mean for, uh, for what we do as architects in the built environment, um, uh, you know, I think it invites like very different ways to think about privacy. Um, I think that, you know, what does it mean to be private um, moving through built space, but also be public online? I think that that's what the, I think what's so interesting about the internet is that it layers, I think, a lot of really complex and more nuanced understandings of um, publicity and privacy or personal space and kind of general or public space. Um, Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Elin. Uh, one last question from Jaden. Jaden, with you. 
want to jump in and ask you a question? Oh, sure. Hi. Um, Hi. So I was wondering, what are some of the qualities of uh, like the iconic landmark that separate like a project from a standard design that you discovered in your research for that project? And how much did that change? Like when, when you were designing, like how much of the word, like it needs to be like an iconic landmark, like change how you approach the process. And also I really yeah. enjoyed the presentation. It was uh, really informative. Thank you. Thanks, Jaden. Um, yeah, I think that's a, that's a good question. I, it's funny, like when we decided to do that competition, um, at least for me, like I thought, it, I, I, the idea that one would ask for an icon in this moment seemed interesting. <laughs> Um, because I wouldn't say that like iconicity is something that um, that like one would strive for or it seems like the right it doesn't seem like the right thing to strive for right now um, and so um, I think that's pre it's precisely why we chose to take this on like we, we thought like okay like if this is what's being asked for like what how could we produce something that at least addresses the prompt but maybe calls attention to the the complexities of that word. Um, and so like we wanted to produce something that wasn't singular, but felt actually more distributed and more multiple, it had kind of multiple readings, multiple um, experiences. Um, we wanted to produce something that hadn't, that dealt with, um, or that contended with its image, its own image, but also wasn't um, um, imageable in a singular way. Um, and I think that we, um, you know, wanted to, to um, design something that um, was engaging, but not as a, but not only as a physical um, uh, object or experience or space, but at, but as something that is sort of tied to um, more complex infrastructures. And so it's like to think about the icon not as something that um, that only exists like in a site, in a singular site, but as something that can like move through other. Um, um, other kind of mediations, other other infrastructures, other technologies. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, well, I think this is it for us tonight. I want to, unless there is something very pressing that we need to address on the chat, but uh, I believe we've answered all the questions here. Uh, thank you, Cyrus. That was really a truly fantastic lecture. I saved for last my